Welcome to MindShift. I'm Brandon. Today is another Tuesday Takedown. Never of people, just of bad ideas, bad arguments, and bad apologetics. And today's video is interesting. We're getting it by way of a channel called Daily Dose of Wisdom. It is a huge channel, over half a million subscribers. And what he has done is put forward a video where he talks about a professor at MIT who was previously an atheist that is now a Christian. He uses two clips, both of which I will put in my description so you can see them at length. I'm only going to be reacting to the clips that he put forward in his own video. Again, he doesn't have much to say about them. He's just kind of presenting them as, hey, look, here was a really smart person who now believes in Jesus. So mainly what we're going to be doing is listening to these two clips and hearing from Rosalind Picard herself. This woman is incredibly accomplished. She is definitely smarter than me, but that does not make her claims of Christianity correct or true. And I think it is interesting to look at someone who has such a strong basis in the sciences as they try to, what I would consider, rationalize their new belief in Christianity. And honestly, before we dive in, I do. I think that's really interesting because so much of what we talk about here are the Christians who have been indoctrinated since birth. Those of us that have been deconstructing from the religion or deconverting from the religion after growing up and waking up. So to see a fully grown adult with all faculties intact, who is otherwise extremely scrupulous and meticulous in what they believe and why, come to the faith is something that I think should be addressed. So let's go ahead and watch the first clip that Daily Dose of Wisdom provides for us. And I'm going to be jumping in because there's a lot to cover here. It's fine to limit the scientific method to things we can measure and reason about and reproduce. I think we have to recognize that sometimes we scientists also believe in things that happen historically. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, I believe the Holocaust happened. I can't prove events from past history scientifically, you prove them with historical evidence, right? With the impact they had on people, with eyewitness testimony and, and things like that. So a, a good thinker recognizes that science is one of many ways to get knowledge. It's not the only way. So I think this is a really interesting philosophical conversation to have. I think science is a method that is one of the best ways, maybe the best way to actually know anything in as far as we can claim to know things. I'm agnostic to many things. I think there are many things that exist and we've put them in categories and we haven't been able to use the scientific method to necessarily prove them, but that doesn't mean, it doesn't have to be this black or white fallacy, that doesn't mean we have no good reason to believe them. And it doesn't put all things that cannot be concluded by the scientific method in the same level of certainty or possibility, right? She brings up the Holocaust as something we can't, by way of the scientific method, prove, but that we know that it happened. And I've seen this, by the way, and I'm not saying that's what she's trying to do, although it seems like maybe that's where we're going. I've seen this argument with the same argument of, well, you know, you say you have problems with the historicity of the Jesus claims, but it's the same way we know all other history. Someone wrote something down, there were eyewitness accounts, and it's like, stop. No, there is such a delta between comparing how we know what we could know about the claims made of Jesus's death and resurrection and all the other miracles associated with that and the claim that he is God himself with something like the Holocaust, where we have actual historical documentation, like orders and memos and administrative correspondence detailing the plans, including the construction and the operation of concentration camps and deportation schedules. We have actual eyewitness testimony and an insane number of eyewitnesses with good verifiable reasons to believe they would have been eyewitnesses. We have photographic evidence. We have physical remains. We have Nazi propaganda from that side itself. We have demographic data, whether it is census records, deportation lists, population statistics, as well as judicial legal proceedings. Like the list goes on and on and on. If we had that for the resurrection of Jesus, I'd be a believer. But to say that because neither of these things can be proved beyond the shadow of a doubt by the scientific method, they're both equal equally plausible is an insane thing to get to. Again, she hasn't got there yet. Many Christians have. That's just a quick rebuttal for that. And also, I hope it shows you 
the layers of when we should go ahead and be convinced of something versus when we shouldn't in lieu of the scientific method. And even those words should are loaded there. But I think that this is hopefully a simple case study to understand some of those dynamics. So what she's going to say next is science isn't the only way to get to truth. There are other ways of knowing. So let's hear what these other ways are. And there, there's been some really bad philosophy and bad thinking recently, you can call it scientism, where people say science is the only way to get to truth. And it's not, it, it just isn't. There are other ways that work also like knowledge of love with someone. You don't prove your love through science. So history, philosophy, love, <laughs> a lot of other things in life show us that there's more ways to gain knowledge and truth, if you're willing to believe there is such a thing, and I, I believe there is, than science. So it's getting tricky. And this is why the whole branch of philosophy exists, is because there is this inter middle ground. And she uses words casually, like no and truth. I think that's carrying a lot of weight with it. Are there ways that I can experience and describe the phenomenon of the world around me and my experience of it that don't have anything to do with the scientific method? One of those things being love? Sure. I love my kids. How could I prove that I love my kids? I think my wife loves me, but I can't prove that scientifically. That's her point, right? But I could also be wrong. It could be that my wife has been tricking me. I've been deceived. I've been duped by my own emotional state and what I've let love do to my brain. So it's not a way of knowing truth. It's a term we use to describe a feeling. And yes, I think I have good anecdotal evidence that my wife loves me, her faithfulness to me, her support of me, her sticking with me despite differences. And if you wanted to make a really big case that over a long enough period of time, there were repeatable studies able to be done within our relationship to dictate what we have called the term love to actually exist from her. Sure, we could try to make a case for that, but I understand we can't put it in a test tube, shake it and get the exact same pH level every single time. So again, I think we're going to get caught up in a lot of definitions and I really don't want to do that because I want to hear what led her to becoming a Christian. But along the way, I think that we have to be skeptical. Like again, history has different levels of how plausible or how much a rational person should believe in those events. I believe in most things I hear about, say, Plato or Alexander the Great, but I take it with a grain of salt. I could absolutely be wrong. There could have been a huge bias in someone writing that down. But there's such a difference because I don't need to rely on Alexander the Great for my personal salvation, right? Nothing is lost if we say, yeah, he probably did have a horse named Bucephalus. Oh, you know what? It was mistranslated over the years. His horse was actually called Aesop. Oh, okay. It wasn't a hill I was trying to die on. It wasn't something I claimed was perfect truth from the creator of the universe. It was something we had good reason to to believe and little reason to doubt. It doesn't mean that it's true though. So yes, there are these different things that we can claim to know, like the name of Alexander's horse, but without it being able to be verified by something like the scientific method to get this level of empirical evidence, I would never claim that is 100% truth. I would never rest my eternal salvation on it. So again, like huge deltas here. Same thing with philosophy, again, same thing with love. And actually, one last thing, and then we'll get back to the video. I want to say that there's two parts of me fighting right now. There is the agnostic side of me, that maybe there is something totally else out there, and we haven't been able to prove it yet, or it hasn't been exposed to us, or we're limited in our ability to see it or sense it, right? This is always the example people give. What does an ant know about physics? It's just not in its realm. Totally totally understand. Maybe there's a creator, maybe there's a God, maybe we're a Boltzmann brain, whatever. But where this conversation is leading is that she was able to progress all the way from a strict atheism through agnosticism into deism and all the way up into a specific belief that Christianity is true. So the atheist part of me in specifically relation to the Christian God claim is hearing all of these things and saying, it doesn't matter. That's not a good example. That's a black or white fallacy. Again, assuming we're leading all the way to Christianity. Within agnosticism, like I get it. We don't even know what's out there yet to be proved, but it is our best way of claiming any kind of knowledge. Well, that doesn't mean that science is perfect or that it's never made mistakes or that it's never been wrong. It means that it is a process by which we can do better. We can have more information to make better decisions with in the future. I do, I am a scientist, however, and in my science, I do limit my science to the things that the scientific method can, can do. But I recognize that it's myopic to say that that's all there is. There's a grand adventure, and I think this life is a part of it. I think there's a lot more to it than meets the eye and the heart and the mind and the 
soul here. I think we we see but through a glass dimly. There's a lot more than meets the eye, the heart, the mind, and the soul. The poet in me loves the idea that there's a grand adventure and life is but a small part of it. I love that. Part of me hopes for that. Part of me is terrified by that. But to say there's more than meets these things, and some of these things aren't even something we could claim to know of anyways, the soul, what would be the use? We can all have whatever imaginary fun we want to have. We can all be as poetic as we want. We can all imagine that there's something more. But if it is truly something above the eye, heart, mind, and soul, what good does that do us? What use is it? Why is it in a conversation about knowing truth? This is the leap that I see happen so often. Someone says, science can't tell us everything. I believe, I feel, I think, I desire that there's more. And therefore, since science doesn't say there can't be, there is. Did you see where the logic broke down? So again, if we're just sitting around on a camping trip, looking at the stars, having fun, deep philosophical conversations, great. But in you talking about your journey to Christianity and being able to tell that there are truths in this world that science can't account for. You don't get to use all this kind of verbiage. It doesn't mean anything. You could be a Muslim and say the exact same thing. You could be a Hindu and say the exact same thing. You could be an alien who doesn't have any concept of any of our gods or religion itself and say the exact same thing. These are essentially, even if they're beautiful, nothing statements. In this life, we see only a part of all there is to know. If people haven't read the, the Bible, they should if they consider themselves educated. And you could read Proverbs and find tremendous wisdom in there that cannot be scientifically proven. But when you read it, there's something in you, like, like a musician knows when the instrument's played right and it's beautiful. There's something in you that comes alive and knows that there's a truth there. When you encounter those truths, there's something in you that sings and knows that there is more than what I can prove mathematically or program a computer to do. Ugh, barf. If people consider themselves educated, they should read the Bible. After just going on this diatribe about there's things the eye, heart, mind, and soul can't even perceive and how that equals truth, we're just going to pull out one book of humanity that is claimed as holy and say that if you want to consider yourself educated, you should read it. Maybe if you want to consider yourself well-read, it could be important to understand that as so much of Western literature has been kind of based in part off of a biblical allegorical sense, sure. But an educated person needs the Bible? No, they don't. A hundred percent they don't. Follow along on my secular Bible study series and tell me so far in the 36 books we have covered, including Proverbs, why anyone would need that to be educated. I actually think it is a detriment to knowledge to hold the Bible in that kind of esteem. I'm not denying the impact the Bible has had on human history, but that has nothing to do with its truth value. She goes on to say in the least scientific thing I've ever heard, when you read Proverbs and there's so much wisdom there that has nothing to do with science and there's something in you that just knows, something in you that comes alive. I've done an episode and I'd encourage everyone to go watch it on other wisdom books. And it's mainly bumping up against Proverbs versus I think I did 10 that are also ancient in the same way that Proverbs is that put Proverbs to shame. Why isn't she referencing those? You know what sounds uneducated to me? Reading the holy book that comes from your traditional surroundings, reading the book that is considered the main source of wisdom within that book, saying that it's so beautiful and so wise and stands so much apart that it leads you to an inner sense of knowledge and beauty and light and everything just comes together for that perfect moment, it really just shows a level of ignorance to me. And then she compares it to a musician who gets the note just right. There is beauty and art and everything happening within music, of course, and it does evoke emotion and feeling for a whole host of psychological reasons, many of which we now know via science exactly how that's working. It takes the mystery out of it. It doesn't have to take the beauty or the poetry out of it, but it's not just something that's happening. Our soul isn't reacting to something to tell us this is correct. So even her using that as an analogy is hilariously counter to the point that she's trying to make. It's not this thing we don't understand that evokes a response in our soul that produces truth and wisdom. This is 
ignorant. Don't get me wrong. The math is gorgeous. The computer programming can be brilliant. It's inspiring, right? We want to do more. None of this squashes my desire to do science or to get knowledge through science. I'm not dissing the science at all. So I wanted to be fair and include this small part here where she is saying that it doesn't mean science doesn't still have its own beauty, magic, and power. That there isn't still this draw to know more and to know that by this set of processes that lead to this kind of empirical level of evidence and that that's still important to her where and when she can utilize it. What we have seen where I feel like she's actually being myopic is that there were so many things we used to think we couldn't know with science. And then we found a way to do so. Again, like music in the brain for one. Near-death experiences is another, right? And the more that we're able to do with that, the smaller these gaps of what we have to attribute to other ways of knowing, soul, spirit, meaning, etc., they get diminished. So is it just a timing issue where we are now with so much left that hasn't been able to be understood via a scientific method? Like, why do we have to categorize? This is my question. Why categorize everything we can't as truth yet to be discovered or truth that can be known a different way? Why not just be actually agnostic to it? Maybe, maybe not. We simply live in a time and place and a level of understanding where we cannot conclude one way or another. Why can't we just say, I don't know? Really at the heart of science, you have to have a belief that there's truth, that there's something greater to be discovered. Some scientists may not want to use the faith word, but it's faith that drives us to do science. It's faith that there is truth, that there's something to know that we don't know. There is meaning, that there is such a thing as meaning, which by the way, science can't prove either. Uh, we have to kind of start with some assumptions that there's things like truth and meaning. At the heart of science, you have to have a belief that there is truth and that that is equivalent to faith. It's these loaded terms that make things so complicated. If we didn't have religion or the history of Christianity, and you want to use the term faith to mean something like an expectation to potentially reach something we otherwise wouldn't, fine. But that's not what faith means. No, you don't need that to begin the scientific method. Many people do scientific studies or follow the scientific process with a full understanding that it might not pan out to anything. What they're particularly looking for or testing for, the hypotheses that they have made might equal literally nothing. It might prove untrue and not even like untrue, but maybe, oh, we just, up oh, there wasn't here. There wasn't enough to measure. We can't make an assessment one way or the other. That's a potential outcome. So no, you don't have to start with faith to utilize science. I think the word expectation is a fine filler there. When we embark with the scientific method, we have a potential expectation that there is something to be found in the way of yes, no, or still don't know. That's it. We are trying to acquire more information. And sometimes the information that gets acquired is not even something that the scientist would say, this is verifiable proof, this is absolute truth. No, it doesn't have to be that either. It's another puzzle piece in place. And sometimes for some things that can lead to something that in as much as we can use the word, we can know. The process of getting to a phone was all done via the scientific method. There was trial and error, there were guesses to be made, steps that we could try to take, see if it worked, it didn't, what about if we do this? Okay, that works, why? Well, if we try to do it this and we repeat the study over here, we didn't get the same result, so it wasn't because of that, maybe, right? Like, it's this whole thing, but it led to, I know, as far as I can know anything, if I dial a specific number on this phone, put it up to my ear, and the other person is available and does the same on theirs, I'm going to have a conversation with my wife, right? That's a fact in as far as we can say facts exist. No faith required at any point. Guesses, expectations, surprises, all kinds of words that aren't the assurance of things hoped for. At no point did anyone need to believe or be totally convinced of anything. And even if they were, it wouldn't change the outcome. We either had the technology and the understanding and the materials needed to get this effect that we were aiming for. That's not faith, right? Again, I think it's so disingenuous to use these religiously loaded terms in having this kind of a conversation because all I see it doing is trying, despite what she is saying, to minimize what science has done to allow a space for the other.
for the other ways of knowing and perceiving and of faith and truth and meaning, which that's the next part of what she's saying here that I want to pick on. She just immediately jumped into this fact that there has to be meaning, that science can't prove meaning, so it's an assumption we have to start with. What? I agree in certain kinds of ways that we claim as far as we can claim things, we've had to make some assumptions. Like when we talk about logic being beneficial and useful in an example of the law of non-contradiction, we are starting with some assumption that yes, if two things claim existence at the same time and they're mutually exclusive, both can't be true, only one can, right? Like this idea that something cannot be both true and false simultaneously is like an assumption that we all have made. That's what makes logic from that part be able to continue out further. So I'm with her. There are some things, and if we're really going to back the philosophical train up, when we use words like truth or fact, it can only go so far because we could all, again, be in a simulation. We could all, again, believe that we're looking at the moon. But every time someone looks up in the sky, some little robot places an image in our head of a moon. So the moon is not actually there. Like, right, we can't know anything in that regard. But in the closed system of assuming we can know anything with that sliver of doubt out there and still trying to make things be useful for us in this existence, we start with some assumptions. Fine. So what? Meaning doesn't have to be one of them. Meaning is a subjective experience. It is a phenomenon that we've given language to. It is a complex and multifaceted concept. It just was this foul ball way, way out past left field that had nothing to do with the argument she was trying to put forward. I just don't understand it. As soon as you get loosey-goosey with some of these terms and the limitations of science, it becomes like this free-for-all where anything goes. And then to the believer who is hearing this, who believes in a higher power, believes in a soul and spirit, finds their personal subjective meaning in what they consider to be the truth of the claim of Jesus Christ. This just sounds so good and refreshing. Yes, yes, yes. And that's why it works so well. That's why channels like Daily Dose of Wisdom are putting it out there. Like it's some antagonistic message against the atheist who doesn't have meaning and can't have truth without this God. When people claim that science will tell you all truth, that's there's a name for that. It's it's its own kind of faith. It's scientism. And it's very myopic. Okay, I actually just went off on like a 30 minute diatribe. And I'm sure many of you will be like, I would have loved to see that. I don't know. It was going in circles. I hate this misrepresentation. Like there are so many scientists and atheist and agnostic people in the world that believe science has the answer for everything. I think that's just fundamentally incorrect. I think it's an unnecessary separation. I think it's way too black or white. And I think she's way over representing how many people would say this. she's cringing at it like she hears it all the time. Have we lost the nuance between someone saying, well, yeah, I believe in a lot of things and there are some things that I just kind of hope for and things that happen emotionally and that are experiences in my life and not all of them I've taken the time to scientifically study and some of them might not even be able to fall within a scientific study. It doesn't mean I reject them, but it also means I won't say something is 100% true unless there is some kind of level of empirical evidence for it. We do need to have a standard somewhere that we use to identify certain parts of truth. That's it. Like This doesn't have to be all or none. This doesn't have to be this black white. This doesn't have to be this damaging, this demonizing to one thing to lift up the other. I just don't get it. Okay. So all that was only the first part. We're going to move into a second clip. This is her journey into Christianity specifically. My views at the time were that Christians and actually all religions I was pretty antagonistic toward were people who really didn't know their science or maybe they needed a crutch or something. I really didn't think they were that smart. Then I started to realize that many of such people were super smart. Uh, and they challenged me to read the best-selling book of all time. As all testimony starts, we have to condemn the old life. She was someone who was antagonistic to religious believers, who thought people were dumb if they believed in a god and just simply needed a crutch, until she was challenged to read the number one best-selling book of all time. What an unnecessary thing. It's like the thinly veiled beginning of an appeal to majority. Ugh, it's just so obvious to me who's seen this so many times how much stock she's going to put in the bible and fine maybe she actually has good reasons for it we're yet to see but if she really did think this way if this isn't just exaggerated for her christian testimony how foolish i get being skeptical of someone who is deeply religious in terms of how they make other decisions in their life 
Sure. But to insult their intelligence level, I think is just unnecessary. I digress. It's not even part of this. I don't know why I'm doing this. As I was reading that against my desires, I started to change my mind about some things. And then I thought, oh gosh, okay, if this book is influencing me to change my mind toward Christianity or toward belief in God, maybe I should study other world religions. So I started to do that, meeting people from those religions and going to temples and mosques and others. I started to realize that not only did I have a lot to learn, but I was on a journey that was starting to make me not only believe in God even more. What I would love is to have her on and have her tell me exactly what she read in the Bible that changed her mind on something and what it changed her mind on. This atheist person who did not know the Bible, that had all this professional experience, that understood the sciences, that has been in the world of academia and has, you know, some pretty high level intelligence, yada, yada, yada. And then she reads the ancient collection of Hebrew poetry and the New Testament accounts of the life of Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection, and God's plan through him for salvation. And it changed her mind on what? on what it was to be a good person, on how we can know truth, right? She's not a Christian at this point. It's just changing her mind on something. And when she's leading into that, it changed her mind into deism in general, thus her checking out all the comparative religions. What was the spark there? Was it what she mentioned earlier, all the wisdom in Proverbs? Wisdom there essentially boils down to fear God or he'll kill you. Watch my video on Proverbs. Was she just so impressed with his decision to reinstitute slavery in his kingdom after having received the greatest wisdom ever? We are told that no man before and no man since has ever been as wise as Solomon. And Solomon essentially decided to reject God. God and institute slavery. Is it that kind of wisdom that blew her away? Was it the character of God that struck her heartstrings as she mentioned earlier? And if so, what character? A few pretty verses from Jesus in the New Testament while having to purposefully disregard everything that is said about this God that he says for himself that his actions portray about him in the Old Testament? Was it the commandment for love and attention and worship and devotion with the threat of hell that made her realize this was so far above human intelligence that it had to be true? I understand why so many of us take so much stock in the Bible as we grow up with it and we're told certain things and we're forced to read certain things and we memorize certain things over over and over and over while ignoring vast amounts of it. I understand how we get an incorrect idea about the Bible and its validity and its power, but I want to know desperately from someone with no basic understanding of it before, they open it up, read it cover to cover, and they're just amazed and impressed with it to the level that they're going to reorient their life around it. Now then she goes on to say that, okay, if she could be wrong about some of these ideas that are now correcting in her mind because of this, maybe she could be wrong about other things. So let's go on this adventure of comparative religion, which if true, good for her, right? But that gets very little attention in this video. Again, I, I would love for this to be more of an interview because I have so many questions. When she went and saw the claims about Vishnu, did she just think, oh, well, these are silly and ridiculous while having no problem at all with the talking donkey and the two she bears that kill 42 children because God was mad about their offense against a prophet. That stuck out as pure revelation, but she just couldn't get past Krishna. Were the claims about Muhammad too insane to be true, not grounded like Christianity, right? Like, again, I'm blown away that anyone could read all the different religious texts out there. And again, who knows what she means? Maybe she just went to one mosque, one temple, and one Christian church, had the positive reaction to the Christian church and said, ah, comparative religion done. But as someone who has read so many other forms of holy books and spiritual text and has done years of religious comparison. Can I just say that there is nothing inherently special about Christianity and its claims and its books? Nothing. Nothing original, nothing unique, nothing transcendent. Stories and myth and lore and parables and moral tales and exaggerated claims like everything else before, during, and after. As I got dragged off to some Christian churches, which I resisted in the beginning, and found somewhere I could ask questions, very important. Uh, I started to realize that the religion was not at all what I thought it was, and that there were some really interesting and very attractive elements that were very uh, historically verified also, uh, not at all what I expected. There were interesting and attractive elements within the Christian church that she didn't see elsewhere. And the only thing that she lists is the more historically reliable aspect of 
some parts of the Christian text that she wasn't expecting. Like what? I'm really pretty aware of all of the different claims in both the Old and New Testament and what history or archaeology has been able to prove or not prove about them. And there is nothing that has been proven historically that gives any power to the Christian message. Oh, there really were walls of Jericho? I'm sold. Oh, there really was a group of people that believed Jesus had died and been raised? It must be true, right? Like I'd love to dive into that with her as well. Well, what was so shocking to you that you otherwise hadn't previously believed about the historic claims of Christianity that are also not elsewhere? There's tons of good, reliable history in the Quran. There's tons of people and places that can be pointed to in many religions where something actually existed. We've had this conversation a thousand times. It's the whole New York doesn't prove Spider-Man thing. All this is to me is someone who had positive experiences with one religion over another. And I wonder why Christianity would have seemed more comfortable and familiar to her than Hinduism or Islam. Probably nothing to do with the fact she's been raised in a country where she's been surrounded by people that believe that, where she pledged allegiance to a flag and God we trust, and that God being the God of the Bible. There's so much, even if you're truly an atheist from the get-go, that is in our cultural DNA that makes us more familiar and thus more comfortable with this particular God concept than one overseas that seems more mystical or more harmful or more foreign, etc. It's its own weird form of bias. It's just crazy. And it's so obvious. In fact, it's been studied scientifically. But here's the last clip I'm going to show you, and then we're going to react. I want you to hear how many instances, just keep your own ear out for it, have to do with her feelings. And as I learned about that, I changed my viewpoint gradually from an atheist to an agnostic to a theist to somebody who actually believed that uh, the historical Jesus and the New Testaments, what's written about him was true. It was not an easy process. But as I did that, and then I was challenged to not only believe this, but to put it to practice. That's where things started to really make a difference in my life. And actually the real reason I'm here right now, spending time talking about something like this, as opposed to just my research, is because it has made a huge difference in my life. When I accepted that gift, it made a huge difference in my life uh, for the better, big improvement. So I didn't realize it needed so much improving at the time. Uh, those around me saw the difference. And um, today, it is my source of strength, uh, an amazing source of peace and joy and uh, wisdom. Okay, and so I wrote it down. Made a huge difference in my life. Seconds later, made a huge difference in my life. When I accepted the gift, it made a huge difference in my life. A third time, for the better, big improvement. Those around me could see the difference. Source of strength, source of peace, source of joy, source of wisdom. Oh, then it's true, right? You can't just vaguely point to, oh, there was more historical accuracy in Christianity than I otherwise would have thought of when I had absolutely no idea about the religion. It was just judging all of them to be dummies. And then say you had a good experience at the church, which surprised you, that you found it interesting, and then that it made all these big improvements in your life and gave you peace and joy and strength and all of these things. All those comparative religions that you looked at, however many you looked at, whichever ones they were, I guarantee you there are people with your exact personal testimony. They didn't know anything about it. They assumed the worst about it. They looked into it. It was interesting. They visited a holy place. They had a positive experience. Someone showed them the historical parts of that religion because most have something that it's grounded in. They were surprised by that. And as they started putting it into practice, those around them noticed a difference and they had some measurable improvement in their life. I guarantee you, for any and every religion out there, you have this exact story a multitude of times over. So what? Really? And now she has this cognitive dissonance in her head where she has her scientific method and her understanding of how you can prove and know things, and she's had to put it aside, which is why we got the entire first clip. Oh, really? Science, if you think about it, is just a leap of faith. No, it's not. Oh, really? If you think about it, we have to assume objective meaning in the world before we can do anything. No, we don't. Do not turn around and then claim that you can know 
it's the only way, that it's the truth, that this gift is for everyone. Your inability to prove it is not on the same level as the Holocaust as she tried to allude to. It's miles and miles and miles away. If she had really looked into this religion objectively, like she says so, she would have ran into the issues with the fact we don't have one eyewitness testimony for the resurrection of Jesus. We have a handful of anonymous claims. That's not amazing historical evidence that you didn't know existed before. And what about all of the counter evidence? What about all of the mutually exclusive claims? I mean, I could go on forever. What this just shows is we're all human. We're all capable of having emotional reactions to things. And that's fine, but we don't need to make these unnecessary leaps. And the fact that it can happen to someone so educated and so otherwise science-minded only goes to show the power of religion. And I've never denied the power of religion, but it also goes to show the fallibility of the human mind, the rejection of logic when it suits you when you put feelings first. And if all it did was give this woman a happy, little, nice, peaceful life, wonderful. But that is not all this religion does. And her story and the way that Christians like Daily Dose of Wisdom take her story and try to make this larger case for, how did he put it in his thumbnail? Atheist MIT professor converts to Christianity after discovering this, right? It's manipulative. You're using her clout and educational background with an incorrect phrase like, after discovering this, what did she discover? She discovered nothing. She had a human experience where she was drawn in by feelings over for facts. That's not a discovery, but how many Christians who are on the fence or doubting or don't consider themselves very educated or smart have heard something about the contradictions in the Bible or how science disproves certain parts and claims of the Bible, and now they think, oh, I mean, if this MIT hardened atheist who used to be totally antagonistic towards Christians has seen the light via this amazing discovery of truth, no, none of that's happening. None of it, none of it is happening at all. She was someone who didn't know much about a particular religion that was very very smart in other areas, and that was duped in the same way that so many people are duped into religion. That's it. And her inability to prove what she now believes leads to this, ah, well, we can't really prove anything. So, you know, it's all the same. And it's so sad to see. It's just so unnecessary. I'll end by saying this. Again, no issues here if it's just true statements. I denied everything that I learned about how to verify proof because I started to have positive feelings toward one specific religion. I liked what it did for me, what it made me feel, and how it made those around me perceive me. And I now believe this to be the case, despite evidence. And I can't prove it, and I can't know it, and that's why it's called belief and faith. But that's not what it is. It's excuse after excuse after excuse of trying to lower science and bring up other ways of knowing to justify holding this belief. That's, that's what I'm seeing going on here. I did this kind of a video similar to the I am beggar video where I really want to cut to the crux of why people believe. And no matter how many times people try to suggest that it's because of some big philosophical understanding or some truth value and something that was discovered, especially coming from an intellectual, it always comes down to the same things, doesn't it? You're either indoctrinated into the religion and usually kept there by some kind of fear or some carrot dangling in front of you, or you are converted into the religion by experience and feeling. So let's just call it that. That's all that it is. If there was more truth here, if there was more empirical evidence, if there was more actual tangible ways to show that this God was the God, that this religion was the religion, that it is the only way, Christians would be lining up to share that truth. But instead, we just get, it changed my life a little bit. Thus, it's true. Thanks so much for being here. Let me know what you think in the comments. If you missed either of my last appearances with Deep Drinks last night or Matt Delahunty on the line last week, feel free to check those out in the playlist in my description. Until then, keep thinking. I wanted to personally thank my top tiers of support. My Iconoclist and GVI, Jacob, Joe, Martin, Oliver, Perry, Rockman, and Sean. My Humanist Heroes, Jared and Christy. My Atheist Advocates, Caleb, Jeffrey, Karen, Sparky, and Todd, as well as all of my Secular Scholar patrons. If you believe in the mission of this channel or you just enjoy the content, please consider joining these fine people. Thanks and have a great day.